Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a quick and dirty tip about the difference between aggravate and irritate, and a meaty middle about something called functional shift. And if you're a Stitcher Premium subscriber, you can also get a monthly bonus episode and all your Grammar Girl podcasts ad-free. Check it out at stitcherpremium.com slash grammar and use the code grammar for a free month to give it a try. Now let's get started. In the past, some experts said you should avoid using the word aggravate to mean annoy or irritate. The verb to aggravate came to English from a Latin word that means to make heavier. The same root gives us the words grief and gravity. So in Latin, it meant to make things heavier, not just heavy. In other words, worse. And the argument that aggravate must mean to make something worse, instead of just to annoy or irritate, hinges on that origin. It can refer to a feeling or a physical problem. For example, having your friend text me right after our fight just aggravated the situation. I know you meant well, but Sarah is allergic to flowers, so sending roses when she had a cold actually aggravated her symptoms. But despite its origin, people started using aggravate to mean annoy or irritate almost right away. The adjective aggravating even more forcefully took on the meaning of annoying or irritating. In fact, you'll find aggravating used in this way more than any other way. You realize it's aggravating when you take my pens, right? To irritate comes from a Latin word that means to excite, provoke, or annoy. It can also describe a mood or a physical problem. Your constant banging on that drum is irritating me. Wool tends to irritate my skin. The admonition to avoid using aggravate to mean irritate isn't particularly important. The American Heritage Dictionary has a usage panel that votes on usages that could be controversial, and in the 2005 survey, 83% of the usage panel thought that using aggravate to mean irritate was acceptable. But you still may occasionally hear a complaint or have an editor who's in that 17% that still thinks it's wrong. In formal situations, or if you're feeling especially sticklerish, you may want to avoid using aggravate to mean irritate. Using aggravating to mean irritating is safer, but some people may still object. One way to remember that aggravate means to make something worse is when you hear police talk about aggravated assault on your favorite crime show, remind yourself that aggravated assault is worse than normal assault just like you make people's mood worse when you aggravate them, or make a situation worse when you aggravate it. Before we get to functional shift, thanks to our sponsor, Blinkist. If you're like me, the list of books you want to read is never-ending. You don't have time to read them all. Our sponsor, Blinkist, has solved your problem once and for all. Blinkist is the only app that takes thousands of best-selling nonfiction books and distills them down to their most impactful elements, so you can read or listen to them on your phone in less than 15 minutes. The Blinkist library is massive, from timeless classics like Think and Grow Rich to current bestsellers like Fire and Fury. I think I'm going to try the five-second rule, transform your life, work, and confidence with everyday courage. But Blinkist has more than 2,500 nonfiction titles just in communication and social skills, so I'm sure you'll find one you'd like to. And right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan when you join today. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash grammar to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan. Blinkist.com slash grammar. And now, functional shift. Recently, Grammar Girl listener Keith Dahl wrote in with an interesting question. Here's what he said. I notice that people often use invite as a noun, as in, I'll send you an invite. I think this is improperly used, but it's so common that I wonder if it's becoming acceptable. I freely admit that I'm rather old school when it comes to grammar rules. Your thoughts? Well, Keith, here are several thoughts. Let's start by observing that you're right. People do use the word invite as a noun. We can tell this by doing a search on Google Ngrams. 
a tool that charts how frequently words are used, mostly in published books. Engrams show us that this word's use as a noun, as in to send someone an invite, is dwarfed by its use as a verb, as in to invite someone. But the usage does occur. We can also note that using invite as a noun, although it might seem new, is actually quite old. It was first recorded in 1659 in a religious text. A certain Bishop Kramer offers a colleague suffering religious persecution, quote, an earnest invite to England with promises of ample promotion, unquote. The use of invite as a verb has an earlier recorded use from 1553. It shows up in a list of instructions for sailors. Quote, if you shall be invited to any lord's or ruler's house, be wary of woods and ambushes that your weapons not be out of your possession. Unquote. Sounds like good advice. Anyway, because the first recorded use of invite is as a verb, it's probably that the word long ago experienced what's known as functional shift. A functional shift, also known as a conversion, occurs when a word moves from one part of speech to another. It does this without changing its spelling, adding a suffix or prefix, or anything else. A functional shift can happen in several directions. For example, nouns can become verbs. Summer becomes to summer. Plate becomes to plate. Google becomes to Google. Adjectives can become verbs. Smooth becomes to smooth. Dry becomes to dry. Crisp becomes to crisp. Verbs can become nouns. To take away becomes a take away. To reveal becomes a reveal. To visit becomes a visit. And even prepositions can become nouns. Up and down become ups and downs. In and out become ins and outs. Are these conversions acceptable? Are they abominable? It depends on the word. Some conversions seem to represent the worst type of business jargon. Let's solution this problem, for example, in which the noun solution has been randomly turned into a verb. Another example would be, when is this deliverable due, in which the adjective deliverable is used as a noun. This type of switcheroo is common in business writing, but it's not necessarily good. In fact, it often signifies that the writer is relying on catchphrases rather than making an effort to write with precision. Other conversions are trendy, and we don't know if they'll stick. An example would be when a friend says she'll Snapchat you or that she's Ubering to work. These examples show how very quickly a noun, even a proper noun, can transform into a widely used verb. Such is the flexibility of the English language and the power of our brains, which allow us to instantly process and understand old words used in new ways. Finally, some functional shifts have become so established that we'd never even know they'd happened. The noun duck, for example, meaning a bird, was derived from the verb to duck, which originally meant to go underwater. The noun wheel came from a verb meaning to go round and round. And the noun house is believed to have come from an ancient Indo-European verb meaning to hide. Duck and house entered our language back when Old English was spoken, from about the 5th century to 11th century A.D. Wheel is believed to have entered the language even earlier. You can see from these examples that, like it or not, functional change in our language is ancient, ongoing, and unstoppable. It may annoy you today if a friend asks whether you salad or sandwich for lunch, but in 20 years this verbification may sound perfectly normal. So if it bugs you when someone sends you an invite to a party and you don't feel like calendaring it, just send them a decline and start Facebooking around for new friends. You're sure to find someone who shares your annoyance with our eccentric, ever-changing language. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find all my articles and old podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com. We just redesigned the website, too, so go there and check out our new look. You can also find me on Twitter and Facebook as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening. Oh,